And I stand before you with a good conscience this morning, convinced that it is God's time to address it in this forum and to be as explicit as I purpose to be in the unfolding of this matter. In all that I say this morning, I'm addressing the members of this congregation and their families. Should God be pleased in the next hour to bring among us 20 raw 21st century pagan women dressed with miniskirts, cleavage almost down to their belly buttons, or with slacks of stretch material that hug their thighs and their buttocks and their crotch. We're not about to meet them out in the foyer and say, you can't come in here and listen to our gospel in that way, and then hand them a shawl and say, wrap this around you before we welcome you into this place. We would welcome them exactly as they show up among us unless they showed up naked. We would welcome them to come and sit under the ministry of the word of God, to sit under the gospel. However, as they sit among us and as they look around, and as they interact with the people of God in this place, whom we are confident would be lovingly aggressive to interact with them, to introduce yourself, to show a genuine interest in them as image bearers of God, sinners, yes, but image bearers of God with the dignity and nobility of an image bearer, that it wouldn't take long for them to draw this conclusion. If I begin to believe what's preached in this place. If I begin to internalize this gospel that is preached from that pulpit, I will begin to dress like the women in this place who are marked by decided modesty and by distinctive femininity. In other words, we take them as they are with a view to seeing them become what God says the gospel will make them. So I want to make that very clear, lest anyone go out and say, oh, well, the elders already still want sinners to come in. And but No, no, my friends, don't go there. Please, don't go there, because that's not where we are. We do believe that society has so degenerated in these two areas of decided modesty and distinctive femininity and is presently squeezing some of you into its mold contrary to the will of God revealed in Romans 12 and verse 2. Be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We believe that the world's pressure is being evidenced in this place in the dress of some of you. Therefore, I come to you this morning with a burdened heart and with a bent knee seeking under God to sensitize your consciences in this area of gospel fruit. You will notice how from my opening statements, I will continually use the terminology validating and illustrating the power of the gospel. And that's the issue that's at stake. It's the gospel that is at stake. It is impossible but that occasions of stumbling should come. In other words, the world being what it is, the human heart being what it is, occasions of stumbling are going to come. But woe unto him, woe unto her, through whom they come. It were well for him, for her, if a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were thrown into the sea, 
rather than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. The little ones are those who believe in him. And my dear sisters, I beg of you to listen to this passage. Any man that lusts after you will answer to God for his mental adultery. But you will answer to God if you've provoked it by the manner in which you are dressed. Romans 14 and verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man, no woman, put a stumbling block in his brother's way or an occasion of falling. That's what we are to judge. Am I in any way, in the manner of my dress, putting an occasion of stumbling before one of my brothers in Christ? Dear ladies, get hold of this principle. Purity of motive does not cancel the effects of your appearance. Purity of motive. You may have a heart as pure as the untouched new fallen snow on a hillside out there this morning. No desire whatsoever to provoke a man to lust, to seduce a man. But the purity of your motive does not cancel the effect of your appearance. You may have a heart as pure as the new fall in snow, but a bared thigh with a long slit up to here will provoke the lustful thoughts of a man. And God says to you, members of Trinity Church, I said, you are the ones whom I am addressing primarily. God says, judge this rather that no woman, no man, put a stumbling block in his brother's way or an occasion of falling. Mrs. Al Mohler, wife of a man to whom God has given literally national prominence with his syndicated radio broadcast and his blogs, she said this, and I want you to listen to her, don't blame the men around you who happen to be unfortunate enough to be within sight and say, they need to get their minds out of the gutter. Proverbs 30 and verse 20 says, this is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done no wrong. Ladies must remember what battles men face to stay pure as they are stimulated visually by women. They should never have it flaunted in their faces, and to have it done at church it is an abomination. That's a woman speaking to her sisters in Christ. And if you find that some of the things you hear this morning are not going down smoothly, we plead with you. Don't seek out others who share your reservations and form a little grousing club. Come to us with an open Bible and show us where we've gone beyond the scriptures. And we will stand in this pulpit and make alterations or retractions, whichever are necessary. Dress in a way that immediately when they walk by, every head turns and you look at the hair piled up on their head in a certain way or their garments adorned in such a way that they are ostentatious, showy, so that when you come to the house of God occupied with God, this woman walks by and you become occupied with her. What Paul is emphasizing is that Christian women should adorn themselves with clothing hairstyles and jewelry, which in their culture are inexpensive, not extravagant, modest, not vain, and chaste, not suggestive. And I believe I am accurate in saying these are ten triggers to lustful thoughts 
let me use this image. These are like magnets in a woman's dress. Magnets that draw men's eyes to parts of their bodies that if they are to maintain purity of mind, they don't want their minds drawn to these parts of a woman's body. Here are the ten magnets to men's eyes. Number one, dresses or skirts with lengthy slits. When a man's eye sees a slit that comes up to the knee or above, he thinks, oh, a few more inches, and what would I see? That's the way a man's mind works. If your fathers have not told you this, daughters, it's true. If you husbands have not told your wives this, shame on you, you know it's true. This is a magnet to men's eyes, dresses or skirts with lengthy slits. Secondly, dresses or skirts which hug the buttocks. I don't know a better word to use. I ask my brethren, what do I mean? My shirt is not hugging any part of my body except uh, perhaps this is hugging my wrist. A skirt that hugs the buttocks is a skirt that not only comes down over the buttocks, but back in to the back of the thighs. When you see pictures of hookers, one of the marks of a hooker, she always has her buttocks hugged, whether it's a mini skirt, whether it's jeans, whether it's tight slacks, her butt is always hugged because that's what she's selling. And that's what she wants men to buy. It's a magnet to men's eyes. Thirdly, any upper garment that hugs the breast. And I don't know a better way to describe it. It's one thing for your garment to come down over and hang loosely upon the breast, but to hug the breast, to shape and isolate your breasts becomes a magnet to men's eyes. People should not receive an anatomy lesson in mammary glands when they look at you women. It is a magnet to men's eyes. Fourthly, unbuttoned blouses, low necklines, or cleavage on any upper body garment. You know what I mean by the buttons? You've got a blouse that buttons up to here. You not only unbutton here and here and here, but you unbutton right down to one button away from bearing your bra. And when a man sees only one button to go, his mind goes, I wonder what's under that one more button. I'm looking down right now at a young woman who has everything up to the last button. It opens the collar, that's all. And the man's mind only sees, that's an open collar. Come two buttons down, and what he sees and what he thinks is an occasion of stumbling to him. John Piper, ministering to thousands out in Minneapolis, he is burdened about this issue and he's posted an article on, his in, on the internet, Is Modesty an Issue in the Church Today? Listen to Mr. Piper. Necklines are an issue these days. Everywhere I turn, at the airport, at the church, the necklines are plunging. Some fashion designers in the world are communicating to women today that the thing to do is to have your neckline split extend too low. Unbuttoned blouses, low necklines on the shirts that may be under your jacket, cleavage of any kind on any upper body garment. And also women, remember, in the church setting you are found at times bending over, picking up a child. Bend over and look at yourself in the mirror before you leave the home. What may seem to cover you well standing, bending over, does not cover you sufficiently to be dressed modestly. Number five, 
another magnet to men's eyes, sleeveless blouses or dresses with large armholes. You look down on your sleeveless dress and you see nothing but your shoulder. But if it's a large armhole, a man sitting behind you looks up at the pulpit, sees through to your bra. And his mind goes where he doesn't want it to go. It's immodest to appear in the house of God with sleeveless blouses and dresses with large armholes. If the armholes are tight enough that no one can see in, then that's your liberty before God. Number six, low-rise skirts or pants. This is the style made popular by Christine Aguilera, Britney Spears, Jennifer Lopez. These sex pots, sex pots, flaunting their bodies in their gyrations with their so-called music. They've made this style popular with the skirts that barely hang on the hip bones and with the jeans that barely come up and cover the crack of the buttocks. I've been in situations with Christian women where I've had to look at the crack of their buttocks because of the low-rise jeans, skirts, or pants. Number seven, see-through clothing of any kind. Clothing that does not cover your undergarments to the point where no one can see them. Some of you need to know the function of a camisole. Number eight, skirts and dresses that are just plain too short. Difficult when you're seated to adequately cover yourself and then you get engrossed in something in a public setting and you're not keeping your knees locked together. And before long, the legs are spread a bit, and anyone just happening to glance can see clean up to your panties. That's not modest. It's immodest. It becomes a magnet to men's eyes. Listen to Mrs. Moeller again. She says, if you arrive at church dressed in such a way that by the end of the service, the people around you, by no fault of their own, know the color of your underwear, and they've watched you do a shimmy dance as you tried to get your too short, too tight skirt to go under you, there's a big problem. I like her humor. You have to do a shimmy dance. But seriously, women, that does not meet the biblical standard, I will, that the women dress modestly. Number nine. Slacks or pants or jeans, hear me carefully, women, that hug the buttocks, the thighs, and the crotch. And crotch is not a coarse word. The dictionary defines it as the place where the legs fork from the human body, the seam or place where the legs of a pair of pants meet. And here I speak from a deeply burdened heart. This is one of the areas, dear women, where the immodesty has taken over in Trinity Baptist Church. Some of you showing up with slacks that I've never asked you what the material was, but they either have spandex in them or they are a kind of material that is a stretch material and hugs the buttocks, comes around and hugs the thigh and presses up on your crotch and the crack of your buttocks, and you have no idea what that does to many a man when he sees it. You draw the eye to the most erotic part of your body. That whole area becomes a magnet for men's eyes. And the apostle says, I will that the women dress modestly. And then number 10, a bared midriff and back. This whole present style where tops come down and just barely, if at all, meet the low-rise jeans. You may look in the mirror and say, well, I'm fully covered. But all you need to do is to reach here and a couple of inches of your belly are showing. All you need to do is bend over 
and people can see your back and usually the top of your underwear, and it's happened right in this assembly. I have seen it Wednesday nights in the prayer meeting to my embarrassment. Thank God, not to my lust, but to my disgust that this would be tolerated in Trinity Baptist Church. One man said to one of his elders, I saw a woman bend over, could see the top of her panties, and I wondered what it would be like to put my hand down her back. A godly young man. Passionate to be a holy young man and cause to stumble in this place. Now, am I saying that I'm negating what I said earlier? No. I am loath to believe that the women involved in the two incidents I've just cited are deliberately seeking to cause men to stumble. But my dear sisters, the purity of your motive does not cancel the effect of your dress. And I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to stick my neck out. I'm going to ask the men seated here this morning and the boys if you find any one or more of these things that I've called magnets for your eyes, an occasion of struggling with purity of mind, I want you to raise your hand. Keep them up, men. Keep them up, please. Hi. Now, my sisters, look around. Come on, 360 degrees. Keep them up, men. Women, turn around. Girls, I'm not looking at you. I won't embarrass you. Get a good look at how many, put your hands down now, men, of your dear brothers are struggling with these issues. I'm not a dirty-minded old man trying to rob you of your Christian liberty. I'm a pastor determined that in this place women shall appear modestly to the glory of God and to the good of their precious brothers. So then, having laid out the biblical basis of our concern, secondly, having identified the ten magnets to men's eyes, what are you to do as a woman. Well, here is my counsel. Let me work down through my notes. Number one, repent. Repent of the ways in which you have unwittingly and carelessly allowed yourself to be sucked in by the world's standards and have caused occasion of stumbling to your brothers. Ask God's forgiveness. Go to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, wash me in your precious blood. I had no idea that those tight slacks that are so comfortable caused my brothers to sin. Oh, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I trust that many of you will have dealings with God today in the way of repentance. Lord Jesus, I had no idea that that shirt that hugged my breasts and shaped them and formed them was an occasion of stumbling. Lord Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me, wash me in your precious blood. Repent, go to Christ in faith. Find the purging of his own precious blood. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Go to your dresser drawers, go to your closet, 
and remove anything and everything that has one of these ten magnets embedded in it. You say, Pastor, I'll show up in the same outfit for the next five weeks. Hallelujah! If it's modest, we'll rejoice. Pray for and labor to cultivate a sensitive and well-instructed conscience before God on this issue. Pray for and labor to cultivate a sensitive and well-instructed conscience before God concerning this issue. I'd be willing if I asked for a show of hands. I, I am 99 and 44, 100% certain that there are not a few of you, women. As I've gone down these ten things, I never realized, I never realized, I never realized. But now you've got an instruction to him that knows to do good and does it not. To him, it is sin. You can't claim ignorance after this morning. And I'm looking out now and I find one or two women's faces hidden from mine. And I don't like that. I like to see your eyeballs. So if you've got a head in front of you, I'm looking over here so nobody will know who I'm talking about. If you just move a little bit, I want to see your eyeballs, women. I want to know, am I striking home to your conscience this morning? You pray. And ask God to help you to cultivate a sensitive, well-instructed conscience before him concerning this issue. We're not advocating you all go out and get a black gunny sack, cut a hole in it, and stick it on your head. Not at all. But we need the quality control. You men, you know what are the magnets to your eyes. Monitor what your wife wears. It hurts me at time when my wife comes up into my study and says, Well, Al, what do you think about this? Uh, I don't know, dear. It looks nice on you, but it looks too nice on you. You be the quality control over your wife. She's not a man. She doesn't think like a man. You can't expect her to think like a man, but you are a man, aren't you? will begin to act like one. Acquit yourself like a man. And say it sweetly. Say, dear, the slit goes up too high. Oh, but, hun, dear, the slit goes up too Oh, but, hun, the slit's too high. In other words, you start out nice and sweet. <laughs> if she resists you, you meet her head on and say, you will not leave this house with that skirt as long as I'm your husband. End of discussion. Richard Baxter, the great Puritan preacher, said to women, quote, And you must not lay a stumbling block in the way of men, nor blow up the fire of their lust, nor make your ornaments snares, but you must walk among sinful persons as you would do with a candle among straw or gunpowder or else you may see the flame which you would not foresee when it is too late to quench it. End of quote. And what do you do with respect to your daughter that pushes you and pushes you with regard to a certain standard? Well, she has again some very helpful counsel. Uh, time is going, so we'll have to skip it. But basically what she says is, you're the mother, you're the father. You stand the ground and you tell your daughter in this house, this is off base, this is off base, this is off base, no discussion, end of the issue. I know something must be done, but how, in what forum, in what way, Lord, give wisdom. And the text that keeps thundering in my ear, the prophet Isaiah spoke of the false prophets, and he said these words, they are dumb dogs that cannot bark. Dumb dogs, a watchdog that when the thief comes, he sits there and licks his hand and he doesn't bark. And I said, oh God, don't let us be charged with being dumb dogs that cannot bark.
that cannot bark and stand against the tremendous pressure that the world is bringing upon you dear women to get you to compromise or to be insensitive to the biblical standard with respect to the matter of your modesty. So I believe there are some of you young women who are seeking to be cutesy seductive. In other words, if one of the men of this church propositioned you, you wouldn't like that, but you like being cutesy seductive. You know what the tight skirt does to the eyes of men and you like it. The gospel is at stake, my dear sisters. Let's preserve it in its substance, in its doctrinal purity, and in its powerful application to take women out of a society where immodesty is the order of the day and make them attractive, tasteful, modest Christian women to the glory and to the praise of our God. Let's pray.